and all the time. And the best is yet to come. Do you believe it? Amen. If, if you're a child, you need to leave right now, I guess. So it's my preaching's way over their head. No, I, I don't know about that. Oh, my goodness. We're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And I'm glad to be back here in, in Indiana. And I want you to know that as I flew back yesterday in my suitcase, I brought a little sunshine with me from Texas. So that's what it's all about today. And I, you can thank me for that. But... Uh, but it is really good to be here with you guys. This past weekend, our students, our junior high kids, had an opportunity to go with Adam to uh, a Believe Conference in Cincinnati area. And here's a picture of some of the kids that were there. And um, they're looking off into space, which is what junior high kids do. And so uh, that's, that's great. But I can't imagine going to a youth event with a youth minister like Adam. I mean, you know, I wouldn't do anything. I'd be like Mr. Perfect because that guy... <laughs> But anyway, uh, they're at Believe Conference and they're, they're in Cincinnati having a great time. And uh, the Believe Conference is a very, has a very special place in my heart because back in 1997, I was a director at Christ in Youth, which is in Joplin, Missouri. And we were doing conferences for high school kids, but they had hired me to come in and to do those conferences for high school kids, but also to think about something we could do for junior high kids. And um, so I remember sitting in um, a meeting with some other guys, directors there at CIY, and sharing with them the vision that I had for a junior high conference. And I said, you know, with sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, that's a great time for them to really learn about their own faith and to, uh, you know, kind of realize that it's not mom and dad's faith anymore. And they start to b find out what they believe in and what they don't believe in and all of that. And so as we're sitting in that, in that meeting, I'm sitting there thinking, I'm going, okay, well, if that's what it's all about, why don't we call the conference Believe? And that was in 1997. And now 21 years later, the Believe Conference is still going, reaching thousands and thousands of junior high kids for Jesus Christ. And it's an amazing, amazing thing that Christ and youth is doing. So let's give it up for God and what he's doing and our students that have got to go experience that. From 1997 to about 2003, 2004, I had the opportunity to direct and to lead that program and to be a part of that, and uh, it was amazing. But I want to tell you about one specific time. We were in Cincinnati getting ready to do a Believe conference there, and we were checking into the hotel. And back then, we used to provide the housing for all of the students that would come. And it was an administrative nightmare, I admit it, you know, and I had some great administrative people that would take care of that, but we would coordinate rooming and all of that for all these groups that would come. About 2,000, a little over 2,000 junior high kids in one hotel for one night. Could you imagine? Well, I was the director of all of this. And one time we, 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 we got there and we got our keys to get into our rooms and it was the day before the conference actually began and we got in the elevator with all the rest of my staff and we're going up the elevator and the elevator stopped at like the fifth floor and a couple of them got out and then the sixth floor, a couple of them got out. Well, mine was on the 16th floor and I was thinking, hmm, this is interesting. And I even had to use my key to get up to the 16th floor. And I'm like, all right, well, as the rest of my staff is getting off the elevator, I'm kind of feeling bad, you know? I'm like, oh, what's going on? So I get to my room and I put the key in the door and I open up the door and this is what I saw. It was beautiful. The presidential suite. And there I was all by myself in the presidential suite. And all of my staff were on the fifth and sixth floor in the normal rooms. And I immediately thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But then I started looking around the room and I was going into the living room and then, and then there was a whole nother room with the bedroom in it and every, and then there was the bathroom. Oh my goodness, the bathroom you would have died for. I mean, it was unbelievable. The, the pool in the bathroom, it was huge. I mean, it was, it almost had a slide. It was really cool. I mean, I was like, let's go swimming. I mean, it was really awesome. And here I am looking at this and, and I'm looking around and I'm like, I gotta tell somebody. Who can I tell? And then I'm like, I can't tell my staff people because they're gonna be upset. And then I'm like, well, I, we didn't have cell phones and all that kind of stuff and it, back then. And I was like, how can I get a hold of my, I gotta tell somebody. I need to tell somebody this is awesome. 
if we'd have had Facebook and all that kind of stuff, I'm sure I'd be taking selfies in the bathtub and putting it on Facebook and Instagram and all of that. And everybody would have known that I was in the presidential suite, but I didn't have anybody to tell, but I wanted to tell somebody. So I got in the elevator and there was a stranger. I didn't even know. I just said, hey, I'm in the presidential suite. <laughs> it's one thing to have something happen to you and not have anyone around to tell, but... What about when something happens to you and there are plenty of people around you to tell, but you never say a word? Listen to these words in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 24, verses 11 and 12. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Man, I, I read this passage and I remember thinking, man, this is heavy. I mean, rescue those who are being led to death. And, and, and if I say, well, I, I, don't, I didn't know anything about it, but yet he judges my heart and he goes, yes, you really did know something about it. You did, but you didn't say anything. You didn't reach out. Does he, not he who guards your life, know it? He, will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Man, the writer here is describing someone who's been captured or maybe caught in court and they're being accused of something they didn't do. And you know the truth but you don't say anything. And the writer of Proverbs says, rescue them, do something, reach out. But you say, it's not my job. I didn't know anything about it. But then there's that painful line, will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? Or you could probably say what they have not done. As I thought about this text this week and as I worked on this message, I couldn't help but think about last week. And as we're talking about our mission from God and how we need to learn to love each other unconditionally and how we need to, to love more and more and more, I couldn't help but think about that message and how it relates to today's message of our commission, the great commission to go and to tell others. I was driving back to Texas last week across Arkansas and there it was, I saw it right on a billboard. I'm not sure what it was for, but it said in big letters, love speaks. Love speaks. And that's been on my heart all week long. That's what it's about, church. If we really learn to love God and we really learn to love each other like we're called to do as a church, then we cannot be silent. Love speaks. Love has to speak up. You just can't hold it in. I have four boys and my third boy is Adam. And I've got a picture of Adam here. Now, that's not Adam now. Adam's in college and um, just wanted to make sure you knew that's not what he looks like now. That's when he was a little guy. And I want you to look in Adam's eyes because Adam was even at a very young age, a young man who couldn't help but speak out when he loved someone or something. He had to say something. When his brothers would get in trouble and Aaron and Mark were usually the ones that got in trouble, Adam would be in the middle of it and I'd have them stand up like the gauntlet, you know, and I'd be before them and I'd be going, okay, boys, which one of you did it? Guess who would step forward every time? Adam. I did it, dad. And the other brothers are looking at him like, yeah, he did it. He did it. <laughs> but Adam had this love in him that he would just reach out. He would just speak out. And he would take the beating for one of his brothers or he would, he would take the blame for this or for that, even though he didn't do it. But he loved his brother so much, he would step out and he'd do that. One time, my wife was in the grocery store and there was a guy standing outside the grocery store smoking a cigarette. And Adam, he uh, said to my wife, he said, hey, mom, hey, mom, that guy out there smoking. And she went, yeah, I know. And, and he said, that, that guy out there, he needs to stop smoking because that's gonna kill him. And my wife said, okay, Adam, all right, I understand. And she went on getting stuff off the shelf and before she knew it, Adam was gone. And she looked over and there was Adam having a conversation with the man outside smoking a cigarette, <laughs> telling him that smoking's gonna kill you. Love speaks. 
Love speaks. So what happens when it comes to telling someone about Jesus Christ? What happens when it comes to us talking about the joy that we experience here? Why so many times does it just stay within the walls of this building? It can be challenging, I know. I know it can be challenging. In Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, we read the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And we all know that we've been called to go into all the world, but it can be overwhelming. We look at that and we go, wow, that's huge. How can I go into all the world? Well, today I want to talk to you just a little bit about how we can fulfill the commission that we've been given in a very real and practical way. The survey was done. Why why do people, why are they afraid to speak up about Jesus? Why are they afraid to talk to someone? Well, number one, some people say they just don't know enough. I don't know, maybe that's you today and and you're afraid to get asked a question you don't know the answer to. I've been there. Afraid to, you know, somebody might say, well, where did the dinosaurs come from? Or, or, you know, some crazy question like, did Adam have a belly button? Uh, You know, just silly stuff like that 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 you look at and people ask these questions and they're serious about it. What about the problem of evil? Why why do bad things happen to good people? And and questions like that. And, And sometimes we don't speak up because we're, afraid we don't know enough sometimes we just say maybe we're not good enough i mean we realize that in our own life we've got things hang-ups we don't want to give jesus a black eye i mean you know we don't want to represent jesus in the wrong we don't want to be a hypocrite and so we're just not good enough so i'm just gonna stay quiet and not say anything sometimes people say maybe they really just don't care I just don't love enough. I mean, let's be real. Let's, let's be honest today. As a Christian, when I refuse to tell someone about Jesus, basically what I'm saying is this. I know, my, I know the way to heaven. I know the way to heaven, and I'm going there someday, and I'm excited about that. But you, you can just go to... Sometimes we just don't love enough. We know the answers. We know the truth. We're on our way heaven, to heaven. But what about those around us? Now you say, that's not how I feel. I, I, don't, I don't want that. That's not how I am. But you know, picture this. If, if you had a, a situation where you saw a car that was on fire and, and it was burning and there was a person inside that car, wouldn't you do everything you could to go try and to save that person out of that car, some of us would immediately drop everything and we would go and we would, we would try to save them from that burning car. Even if it risks if injury to us, we would do that. There are some of us who would not. We would say, well, oh, that, I might get burned. I might, okay, so here, put on this burn-proof suit. All right, put this burn-proof suit on and then go and rescue them. And some of us still, we might not do that. And, we, and if somebody would do that, you know, with, without any risk of getting hurt or anything like that and still wouldn't go rescue that person out of that car, you would go, that person, that person should be arrested. That person should be put in jail. I mean, come on. Why wouldn't a person do that? And yet when you and I pass by someone who needs to know about Jesus, really how different is it? We have people around us every day, folks, right here in our community who are lost and they're dying and they're going to hell and somebody needs to tell them. Somebody needs to do that. Well, I wanna look at a story in the Bible that may help us out today because I don't wanna lay on a guilt trip or anything like that because I'm speaking to myself too. There are so many times I'm afraid to speak up. I'm afraid to say something when I should, but I don't, and I haven't, and I've been there. But there's a a story that happens in Mark chapter five that I think we can look at today real quickly, and I think it can help us out to give us today what we need. But in Mark chapter five, starting with verse one, it says this, that they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. 
When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. Now, this man lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. This man was, was, was living there in the cemetery. And, and it wasn't like a cemetery that you and I would think of with the tombstones and all of that. This was more of like a, a, a cemetery of little houses or crypts. And when the people would die, their bodies, when they would deteriorate to the bones, then they would take their bones and put them in the crypts. And that's what this place was. And Jesus and his disciples, they decide to go across over to this area. They cross the Sea of Galilee, and when they do, they get out of the boat. Now imagine this, if you would. All of his disciples are with him. They get out of the boat. They're in this cemetery. And who in the world would think that it would be a place where somebody would want to live or to sleep? But the Bible says this was a man who was possessed of demons and he lived in the tombs. And already this story is really strange. But back to the text in Mark chapter 5, verses 6 and 8, 6 through 8. It says this, when, they saw, when he saw Jesus from a distance... This man who was demon-possessed, he ran and he fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. So this man with the impure spirit came out to meet him. He lived there in the tombs and the Bible says that no one could contain him. He had chains that were wrapped around him. They were broken though because they couldn't contain him anymore. And there's so much that could be taught here. But let me just say this. When you turn your life over to Satan and to selfishness, things are not gonna go well. When you turn your life over to Satan and to selfishness, things are not going to go well. It's real. It's real today, just as it was in that day. What a tragedy in Florida this past week. Young man says he heard voices. What do you think those voices could have been? acted out demons evil it's real it's alive even today and that's what happened to this guy I mean I imagine he was just a normal guy in the community but he allowed his life to get consumed by Satan and the demons took over he turned away from God he turned away from, from following him, maybe, if, if he was at any time. But, but now he, he, here he is, he's cutting himself. He's hurting himself. And one of the other gospel writers even tells us that he was naked. Now, I don't know about you, but I if I was in that boat with Jesus, one of his disciples, and we got out of the boat, and all of a sudden I look up in the cemetery, and here comes a naked man running down towards me, and he's got chains wrapped around him and ropes, and he's screaming and yelling, and the voice may have sounded weird. I don't know. I tell you what, I, I'd be back in that boat, and I'd be rowing, saying, Jesus, you can walk on water. Come on, catch up. I'd be out of there. That would scare the daylights out of me. The people had tried to chain him up, but he was too strong. He was too wild. He was too crazy. I don't think his, his hair was combed or his, his teeth were brushed, and he's running toward Jesus and the disciples. But Jesus does something different here. He goes, whoa, wait a minute. The guy cries out and he says, don't torture me. Don't torture me. Then you realize that it really wasn't the guy talking. It was the demons. Mark chapter five, verse nine, we read on. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied. For we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. He said, my name is Legion. Legion is like a military term or a group of soldiers, a word for a platoon kind of thing. It was more than one. It was many. And so in this guy were many demons. And, and they begged Jesus, 
They begged him, now I want to stop right there. I think that's awesome. And what a great reminder. They begged Jesus. They pleaded with Jesus. Well, you know why? Because they knew the power that was in Jesus Christ. They knew the power that was there. Amen? And those demons, they submitted to that power. That is the Jesus that we love and that we serve. But what does Jesus do? Verse 11, a large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. And if you've never heard this story before, this is crazy. There's a, a, a large herd of pigs feeding on the nearby hillside and the, demon, the demons, they begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out of the man and they went into the pigs and the herd, about 2,000 in number, they rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they drowned. Picture that in your mind. 2,000 pigs. And they, all of a sudden, the demons went into the pigs and the pigs went nuts and crazy just like the man was nuts and crazy. And they went and they ran and they jumped over the cliff into the lake and the Bible says that they drowned. It's kind of like swine suicide, I guess. Or as somebody said earlier, suicide. That was bad. Or one old preacher, he said that was the first case of deviled ham. I mean, depends on how you look at it. But 2,000 pigs on the hillside, Jesus sends those demons into the pigs and they drown in the lake. Verse 14 those tending the pigs <laughs> could you imagine I mean these are the guys that were out there taking care of these pigs you know what they did they ran off and they reported this in the town in the countryside and then the people went out to see what had happened I mean they didn't have Netflix or anything like that they wanted to go see what was going on they took off and they, they, they went to find out what was happening as the people were, were talking about it and when they came to Jesus, they said they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. Can you imagine? This is the guy that they've seen for a long time who was wild, who was crazy. They put him out there in the cemetery to live. They tried to bind him with chains and with ropes, but they, it wouldn't work. And they were afraid of this guy. He was nuts. But here he was, sitting at the feet of Jesus, and he was whole once again. And the Bible says that he was dressed and in his right mind. And then it says this, and they were what? Afraid. They were afraid. I'm not so sure why they were afraid. Maybe it was because what is Jesus gonna do next? They're looking at the man. They're looking at all these pigs floating in the lake. They're looking at all of this stuff and they're going, what? What's going on here? And the people, it says they were afraid. When they came to Jesus, they saw him in his right mind and they were afraid. But those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and they told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. Now, does it occur to you that maybe, why didn't they say, oh, Jesus, thank you, thank you so much. We've been, we've been praying for old Harry over here that he'd get better. Oh, thank you so much. But no, they begged him to leave. They wanted him to get out of there. They were afraid. They didn't know of the power, what to do with the power of this man. And Jesus didn't argue with them. The Bible says that he just went, okay. And he began to leave. He didn't say to them, oh, you need me. I came to be your savior. I came to die for your sins or anything like that. He just turned and told his disciples to get in the boat. And they get in the boat and they start to go. And as Jesus is getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed, they begged to go with him. That man, had be he came to Jesus and he said, please, I want to go with you. You healed me. I'm whole again. I'm thinking clearly. Thank you, Jesus. I want to go with you. And Jesus turned around and said, no. Mm -mm. What did Jesus tell him to do? Jesus said this, Mark 5, verse 19. Jesus did not let him, but he said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy 
on you. Go tell what the Lord has done for you. Would you say that with me? Go tell what the Lord has done for you. That's the message for today. If we could really grab a hold of it, in a few moments, we're gonna leave this place and we're gonna think about where we're gonna go eat and what we're gonna do for the rest of the day and we, we get back into our normal routine for the week and on and on and on. And yet, Jesus is saying, go tell what the Lord has done for you. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like for that demon-possessed man? He knew. He's back in his right mind. He knew what the people thought. He knew how he was an embarrassment to his friends and to his family. He knew all of those kind of things. Could you imagine? But the Bible says that the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were what? Amazed. They went from being afraid to amazed. All because one man decided to go and to tell what the Lord had done for him. Now, I wanna ask you, if Jesus can do that in the life of a person way back then, do you think he can do it in your life today? I believe with all of my heart that he can do it in our lives today. That the people that are out there who are afraid can change to being amazed through your story through how God has changed you, how God has healed you, how God has, has made you into who you are today. I believe that that can really happen. You might be here today and you might be saying to yourself, well, I just don't know. I don't know if I could ever do something like that. I don't know if I could ever tell somebody else about Jesus. I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm not good enough. You know, we talked about that earlier. Maybe I'm not good enough. Well, I got news for you. Look around you in the row, all right? The rows are filled with messed up people. Now, don't look at them right now. But we're, we're all messed up people, folks. We're all broken people. None of us in this room are good enough. None of us are good enough at all. So what should I say? Should I come just, hey, come to church with me? Well, well that's a start. But I wanna share with you real quickly what you can say if you wanna take seriously this commission to go tell what the Lord has done for you. Here's the good news. Number one, you can tell them that you have a father that will never leave you. You have a father that will never leave you. You know, some of us, we've lost our fathers. Some of our fathers have less, left us in our life and left a huge void in our lives. Some of us go through that pain uh, in, our, in our lives. Some of us don't. Some of us, like, I have a father who is there all the time and he loves me and he cares for me, but someday my father's gonna pass away and he's going to be gone. And my father's gonna leave me. But I have a father, a heavenly father who will never, ever, ever, ever leave me. And he will never leave you. And that's something you can tell people. Another thing you can tell them is this, you have a family that will always love you. You have a family here at this church of people who will always love you. If you're a part of the body of Christ, you will always be loved no matter what you go through. No matter what you face, we're gonna walk with each other at this church, Seymour Christian Church. We're gonna do life together. We're gonna love each other and care for each other. There's gonna be ups, there's gonna be downs, there's gonna be all those kind of things. But I want you to know today that if you're a part of this body of believers here, you have a family that will always love you. Number three, you have a forgiveness from all of your sins. Is that good news today? Anybody excited about that? I don't know about you, but I'm a sinner and I, I mess up but I've been forgiven of all my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And I have a future that can't be taken away. A future that can't be taken away. I know where I'm going. I know what's taking place and I have a future that cannot be taken away from me. So go tell what the Lord has done for you. This is something so challenging for me this week. Go tell what the Lord has done for you. Last night, got in the plane to fly back. I sat down by the window and this lady was in the seat right next to me. She goes, where do you live? I said, well, I'm, I'm moving right now to Seymour, Indiana. And she goes, oh, such a conservative place. 
I look out the window. I'm like, oh, Lord. <laughs> and then she said, so have all these people come up and asked you to come to their church? <laughs> I was like, well, didn't really say anything. Except I'm thinking in my mind, go tell what the Lord has done for you. And I'm struggling. I got to be honest with you. I'm struggling. I want to sit there and I, I want to just chill. But here's this person asking all these questions. And finally, it, I knew it was coming. So what do you do? I'm a pastor. <laughs> Go tell what the Lord has done for you. And for the next two hours, one question after another, after another, after another. But I remember thinking to myself, man, I just want to be silent. I just want to sit here. But I had one, a great conversation with someone, someone who caused me to think about some things. And hopefully I caused her to think about some things. And I remember thinking to myself, God, thank you for that. Go tell what the Lord has done for you. And one of the greatest things I was able to share with her last night was how God had changed my heart and my life. Brothers and sisters, we need to do the same. We have a future that can never be taken away. When I was a kid, I used to watch the cartoon, The Roadrunner. You remember that? Me, me. The Roadrunner, he never, ever got caught. I mean, the Roadrunner was one of, these, one of these cartoon characters, you know. He could always get out of any situation, and in the end of the cartoon, it was over, and everything was great. I mean, how did he do it? Well, as an adult, I figure it out now. He had an agreement with the writer. I mean, no matter what would take place, no matter what would happen, the writer would just write the end of the story in a good way, with a good ending. No matter what Wiley Coyote would try to do with his TNT and all the rest, the Roadrunner, he survived. He had an agreement with the writer of the show. Brothers and sisters, we have an agreement with the writer of our life. No matter what situation you face, no matter what takes place, Jesus says, just trust me. I'm gonna write you a great ending. Is that good news today? I mean, I think about that. And I think like the flying in the airplane last night. I mean, what if we took off and, and right after we got into the air, I looked over and the right engine flamed out, caught on fire. And then I looked out the window to the left and, and the engine on this side, just the bolts broke loose and the engine fell off. I mean, what would happen if, if all of a sudden we get this message, our, excuse me, our pilot has had a stroke. Oh, and the co-pilot just dropped over dead with a heart attack. And, and what if uh, the guy in front of me stood up and he turned around and he said, I've got a bomb, I'm a terrorist. You know, and all this stuff starts happening in this plane and we're going down. What if that would be taking place and imagine that plane is heading toward the earth and it's about ready to crash and to burst into flames and I'm in that plane and Satan is saying, Andy, ha ha, I finally got you. Well, not so. Because when that plane hits the ground and explodes, the last thing the devil's gonna hear from me is beep, beep, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> Amen? And the same is true for you. But brothers and sisters, go tell what the Lord has done for you. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this opportunity this morning to be here. And I pray that church this morning isn't just another day to go to church, but that, God, today you would just challenge our hearts and speak to us in this way to, to not hold it in anymore, that we would become a church of people who, when we leave this place, Lord, it wouldn't just stay within our lives and in our hearts, but, God, we would go and we would tell and we would share the incredible message of the gospel of Jesus. And so, Lord, help us today to understand the great things that we have in you. 
Help us to understand how you provided for us in so many incredible ways. And Lord, help us not to hold that in any longer. But help us to go and to tell what you have done for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. We're gonna stand and we're gonna sing together just a short chorus of a song. And this is an opportunity for you to respond today to God and maybe how he's speaking to you in your life. And, and maybe um, today you'd like to uh, accept Jesus.